Hey everyone, Brendan Satter here. How are you? Thanks so much for joining me and welcome to Albums Turning 30. Has time changed people's minds about these albums we're going to be discussing here? So 2024, which means albums from 1994 turning 30 this year. And that was a real strange time for music. Uh, glam metal was no longer king. Classic rock was starting to make a return. Uh, the airwaves, which had been dominated by grunge music, and that was on its way out. And so nothing was really there to take up the mantle in 1994. When these albums came out, and they kind of came out to varying degrees of success, uh, some did all right, some of them really ran under the radar when they shouldn't have, and now 30 years on, we're going to take a look back and see if time has changed people's minds about these albums. So we're going to get into that here in just a bit, but before we start, if you're new to my channel and you haven't already hit the subscribe button, please do. Also, leave a comment, hit like, all those things help support my channel, I'd greatly appreciate it. And of course, as an added bonus, by turning on notifications, you're going to stay up to date on everything going on in the world of music, just like this with a cool episode called Albums Turning 30, Has Time Changed People's Minds? All right, so kicking off in uh, no particular order other than I'm going to do this alphabetically. And this is just a selection of five albums here to talk about, but obviously there were so many that came out in 1994. So obviously not everything being covered here, but I just pulled these together as in my opinion, these related in a way where has time changed people's mind about these albums. So first one up to talk about Cheap Trick, Woke Up With A Monster, their 12th studio album. Uh, it was their first and only release for their new record label at the time, Warner Brothers Records. The band had spent their previous catalog on Epic Records. This one produced by Ted Templeman. So having uh, the Van Halen producer come in to work on this album here. And uh, most times when producers came in and worked with Cheap Trick, they would try to soften the band up. Uh, for example, like the song The Flame. But it seemed like Ted Templeman here on this album really uh, focused on their rock uh, sound. And I thought that was a big defining element as far as this album went. Five singles in all would be released for this album here, but I didn't hear any of them on the radio. I didn't see any of them appear on MTV. And uh, ultimately, I didn't even know the album had come out when it did. I would later find it in a cutout bin, if you guys remember those. Back in the day, uh, discounted, reduced albums had little cuts in them in their spine or a hole punch in the UPC code uh, so that you could not return it for full value. But that was a discounted album, which unfortunately usually meant that the album didn't do well at all. And you, you were getting it at a discount because they were trying to move it. And sometimes that meant uh, the album really wasn't very good. And other times it just, uh, you had no idea why an album that good would turn up that way. But the album itself, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on it over the years uh, that the, you know, by the time that the album had come out, that the people that had signed Cheap Trick to Warner Brothers, that team had changed and there was nobody left to promote it properly. And I don't really know whether or not that would have helped this album or not helped this album. Obviously, if you got a good team behind you, it's going to help. But this was, uh, you know, bands of the 70s were starting to make a comeback and maybe Cheap Trick was too associated with the 80s having had the big hits like The Flame and the popular albums and stuff like that that they were not going to get uh, carried into that resurgence of 70s rock the way that they really should have been. But this album itself I thought was a fantastic album and I'm curious whether or not Time has changed people's opinions. It may not have sold well at the time or been a critical darling or anything of those, that nature, but I think the album stands up as good today as it did back then and even better in some cases when listening to it and washing away whether we're talking about popularity of single sales and stuff like that. Opening track, My Gang, on here is just a killer rock song right out of the gate. And the title track, too, Woke Up With A Mom, Monster is a monster of a song on here. I mean, the album itself is full of the melody and the hooks and everything that we know and love from Cheap Tricks. So this album here, I think, actually shows better today, 30 years on, than it did back then. Let me know your thoughts on that one. 
All right, next one up, Alice Cooper, The Last Temptation. It was his 13th solo album at the time, 20th album overall, when you take into account the Alice Cooper Band albums. And this one here would be the last album he'd release on Epic Records, which uh, having released the classic albums earlier, Trash in 1989 and Hey Stupid in 1992. So it was a little bit of a surprise when this one came out and really kind of ran under the radar yet. Songs were still heard on the radio. I still saw some videos on MTV and stuff like that. Um, this uh, period of the Epic Records era of Alice Cooper ran from 89 to 94, and there was a big resurgence early on, but it just didn't carry over into this release here the same way that it had for him on Trash and Hey Stupid, of which he had huge radio hits and huge uh, videos on MTV, was played all the time on stuff like that. But of course, you know, the ever-changing market which also having Alice Cooper, who was an ever-changing chameleon, was, I still is, right? Changes with the times all the time. And he had changed from the glam metal guest of Trash and Hey Stupid on the two previous albums to what was going on at the time, the alternative rock and grunge scene. And even though 1994 was at the tail end of all of that, um, it really should have helped this album out. Uh, continue on with that success, but it uh, neither really helped it or hurt it, I would say. It didn't really do anything for it at all. I will say that I remember at the time being a fan of Trash and uh, Hey Stupid, those albums which had guests on it like John Bon Jovi and Slash and Ozzy and people like that, Joan Jett, uh, to ultimately question why he had people like Chris Cornell appearing on this album. Not that I wasn't a fan of that, I just didn't think that that was the right group of fans that would be looking at Alice Cooper. And so maybe it did hurt it in some way, you know, uh, with people like that at the time. But in retrospect, the funny thing is, I probably go back to this album more than I do either Trash or Hey Stupid. Now, I will say I think Trash is a perfect album of the glam metal era, even though uh, Alice Cooper really comes from the glam rock era of the 70s. Uh, he did make a perfect glam metal album. Hey Stupid was a cool album, but it really doesn't hold up over time, in my opinion. And this album here, the album that I never would have thought would have been one I would have returned to. It did not grab me back in the day. Over time, this album here has really, really become a favorite of mine. And as I said, I think I pull this out more than any other Alice Cooper album. And I'm constantly baffled because I think the album is so good from start to finish on here that I wonder why it didn't do better. But I think it has a lot to do with where media was at at the time. Alice Cooper being part of the old school, old guard. Even though he had reinvented himself in the late 80s, early 90s, he was still part of that and it just didn't translate into the alternative rock grunge movement that it was. But there's a lot of killer standout songs on this album here, Sideshow, the opening track is amazing. Uh, you got the songs like It's Me, of which Chris Cornell guest vocals on. Uh, you got the song Nothing's Free, which is killer. I will say that the song Lost in America, I thought was a very boring track, even to this day, kind of in terms of the rest of the album. And I don't think it was a good first single to have released, and I probably heard it, but listening to the album as a whole, I think does much better today than it did back then. So let me know your thoughts on this album here, whether or not you think that time has allowed this album to now rank higher and be taken more seriously in the Alice Cooper catalog than it was, say, 30 years ago upon release. All right, now this next one here I know has its hardcore fans that still champion it today. And I'm talking about Motley Crue, their self-titled release, sixth studio album, they had a new look, a new sound, a new singer, still had the same producer with Bob Rock in there, but this one here, first album without original vocalist Vince Neil, coming in for him was John Karabi from The Scream, taking over, and what a big shift that was overall for the band. Um, you know, the album itself was a more darker uh, style, heavier guitar sound of 
fair it fit for 1994, but it was a big change. Myself, I was a huge Motley Crue fan through the Dr. Feelgood era. That's how I found them. I went backwards, fell in love with them. They were my favorite band at the time. Through this release, they actually remained my favorite band. This did not drive me away, but I will say that um, with Vince Neil out of the band, um, I was torn because I loved that sound so much. I did very much enjoy when John Karabi came in. Now, does that live up to, say, the Dr. Feelgood album, which I think is a perfect album? No, I don't think that it does. But for what this album was, had it not been released in 1994, I think it would have done very well. I think Motley Crue could have continued on the way that Van Halen did, changing singers in uh, 1985, but it was just the era in which the album came out in. And I think that the album as a whole did well critically um, and stuff at the time. And I do continually see this album ranking high on people's lists. But all in all, uh, it was an album that uh, didn't get a lot of love and only went gold. And after the six-time platinum affair that was Dr. Feelgood, that's a huge letdown. I mean, gold as an album, 500,000 copies is nothing to, to snuff at, but it didn't hit the platinum markers of previous albums, where all their previous albums, I think, had done 2 million in sales minimum. So this one was a way underperforming album. The, the positives, though, is that Mick Marsh was still used to full effect on here. His guitar playing was amazing all over the place, unlike on later release Generation Swine. This was also the first new album, though, when the band signed with, re-signed, I should say, with Electra Records, and it was a $25 million contract, and it was the highest paid contract to a band of their era coming out of the 80s. Um, this album here, you know, probably came with a lot of, I don't know if I want to say strings attached to it, but certainly pressure on the band to churn out a big seller like Dr. Feelgood. And I think they were well on their way to doing it. It just came out when the industry changed too much, unfortunately. Now, the thing is, the band also dropped this at the same time, Cortinary, and it was a mail order only EP. This is a Japanese release that added four bonus tracks to it, nine tracks essentially making it a full length album. But the album featured one additional band song on here with four songs which were each solo songs from the members, trying to show you a different side and what they brought to the table. And I think it was a very interesting idea, but the solo stuff was so different than what was won on this album here that it really took you off in a different direction. And again, I think it pulled you further away from the Motley Crue sound. So for people who were getting these things, it was really taking you in a different direction. And I don't think it was reinforcing who Motley Crue really was. Um, and it probably ended up hurting them overall. But I do think in the end of the day, it was radio, MTV, and uh, the general music public and media that really pulled the attention away when this album here was ultimately a very, very solid album probably should have done better than it did. And I think definitely 30 years on, this album is seen way better today than it ever was back then. Like I said, I still see this thing popping up on, um, you know, top lists and stuff like that, album rankings and stuff. All right, this next album here did well at the time. And I would say probably isn't ranked as high today as it was thought of back then. So it's kind of a reverse thing, but I wanted to talk about it regardless. Pink Floyd, The Division Bell. So Pink Floyd being my favorite band, having gone from Motley Crue to Pink Floyd to other ends of the spectrum in terms of bands, but that's just how my mind was at the time. So this one here, 14th studio album, second one without Roger Waters, but it was the first album featuring the return of Rick Wright, full-time keyboard player for the guys. He had only done a little bit of recording on previous album, Momentary Lapse of Reason, and most of it was background uh, sort of stuff. It was not full 
solo or anything of that. So this one here was the first sort of real band effort album because Nick Mason also played very little drums on the previous album. This one here to me was the first return of Pink Floyd, making it for an interesting um, album. It was also the return of Rick Wright on lead vocals where he had not recorded a lead vocal since 1973 on Dark Side of the Moon. The track on here, Wearing the Inside Out, is actually one of my favorite songs on here. And for a long time, I didn't actually know that that was him on here. I was not yet somebody who really devoured uh, the booklets with uh, looking at who played on thing, the credits, all that sort of stuff. I was still sort of on the cursory of uh, music and just, you know, what I heard, whether I liked it or I didn't like it. But later when I found out that he was the lead vocalist on it, um, I found that to be very interesting, realizing that we had a two lead vocalist uh, you know, album here like we did when Roger Waters uh, was part of the group, obviously doing more vocals than Rick Wright, but I did very much like that aspect and think that that lent some more, um, uh, you know, props to the band and uh, credibility, so to speak, as well. The biggest thing I have to say that I remember from this album was the hoopla at the time about around the announcement of it. And um, radio stations were promoting the heck out of this announcement to the point that I remember it was such an event that I had to pull over to the side of the road to really sit and listen and devour what this thing was all about that was getting ready to be announced by Pink Floyd. Uh, very different than today where, um, you know, band does something on YouTube or whatever and you can watch it at any point. But when something was live like that, you had to make sure that you were going to be by a radio or by a TV or whatever to tune in to get it or you just missed out and so that was a whole different era back then in 1994 but the album was very successful going on to sell around 2 million at the time ultimately it sold 3 million over the the era of it and while the album itself doesn't rank all that high for um, you know Pink Floyd fans uh, as a whole, especially ones that are hardcore Roger Waters enthusiasts, um, I have to say that for me, this is one of my favorite albums from the band. Um, I really like the David Gilmore era of the group, and the album at the time was intended to be a double album and to get um, a second disc of ambient music that ultimately 20 years on in 2014, they would complete with the Endless River. So this disc here was really meant to be uh, combined as a double release, but it just didn't happen. And I wonder whether or not the double album effect would have made the album any much more of a bigger event and could have really drilled it into the public's mind to ta be taken on as a bigger, more classic, say, album. I don't know. Um, I have to say, I kind of like the way it happened, though. We got two standalone releases instead. I wish it wasn't 20 years between it. But ultimately, I find both of the albums, The Endless River and Division Belt, to be very classic-sounding albums. That's just my take. I, as I said, am a big David Gilmour fan. But this album here, all in all, I don't think has worn as well over time. It was big and popular for the day, having had hits and stuff off of it, and the media went nuts for it, but I just don't think it holds up over time. Whereas I personally think this is a classic album 30 years on. I just tend to think that uh, probably most people watching this and other Pink Floyd fans would probably tend to disagree with me on it. Okay, and the last one to touch on here, ZZ Top Antenna, their 11th studio album. This was the first release for them on the new label RCA Records, which at the time they had signed a $35 million record deal largest record deal signing of any band back in that era. I talked about the Motley Crue one at 25 million. I actually think Motley Crue might have signed theirs first before um, ZZ Top did because I remember there were competing things. I When I heard the 25 million and then turned right around hearing the 35 million, that was a big deal. But Motley Crue being of the glam metal era and ZZ Top being of the traditional rock or classic rock sounding stuff. So really of two different eras, even if they had happened roughly at the same time. 
But all in all, there was obviously a lot of focus on this album. Because of that, the band having had huge, huge success with Eliminator, Afterburner, and even to varying degrees, the million-selling follow-up Recycler, which didn't perform as well as the two earlier albums, but still the band having had monstrous success throughout the 80s, signing a $35 million deal moving into the 90s. I'm sure everyone involved thought this was a done deal. They were just going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and unfortunately that was not the case due to the change in musical climate that I don't think really anyone was able to foresee and had people been able to foresee that we would have had a lot more of those types of artists out there but everybody scrambled after the fact to sign all the alternative rock and grunge bands under the sun uh, in some cases signing anyone that was just from Seattle whether they had that sound or not but Releasing in 1994, I think, also hurt this album as a whole. It was still successful selling a million copies the same way Recycler did, but I actually think this sold a million copies based on the fact that there wasn't a lot of bands sounding like this at that time because of the grunge movement. And it was the alternative to alternative that made this album sell. And I think that it's one of those things that over time, people have reassessed this and heard it and realized how great of an album it really is. It still had two hits on it at the time that were on MTV and the radio. The song Pincushion, first single on this, would later actually turn up on their 13th studio album, Triple X, in 1999 as Sin Pusher. And I don't know if that was maybe the original version of the song or just something they decided to turn it into a little tongue-in-cheek to have some fun with. But the song Pincushion being successful. But the one that was sort of the surprise hit for the band that was even bigger than Pincushion and got them on daytime you know, radio, playing with all the grunge bands and stuff like that, the sort of popular stuff that was out there, was the second track, Breakaway. And that one was a slinky, sort of sultry-sounding song that was very unique for the band. It wasn't much like anything that the band had done previous to this, so they were breaking some new ground. That in and of itself probably helped, but also the fact that it didn't immediately sound like a ZZ Top song, so thereby people couldn't immediately be turned off to it, and they would hear it and would go, wow, who is this? And then when they were told it was ZZ Top, it was sort of the, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I like ZZ Top. Um, I had a friend who was very much into the whole alternative rock thing that became a big fan of this song and album simply through this track, never having really been a fan of ZZ Top before that. So it was certainly a gateway song uh, to the band, and I thought that was a very interesting thing at the time. But the rest of the album sounding very characteristic of ZZ Top, kind of much like the last album, Recycler, not so much like Eliminator or Afterburner, having had a lot of that 80s flair stripped away. And I think that was also a positive selling point to this album as a whole. And so looking back at this album, this one here, if it doesn't already, should rank way higher today. 30 years on, giving that hindsight view to this album and having talked with a number of people about this album, I hear from them as well that they see this in a much more positive light today. And I continually see this one also ranking much higher on album rankings and things of that nature as well than we traditionally see of some of the other albums, say, like Recycler, that I personally love but doesn't tend to rank as high. So there you go. That in all in all, that's uh, five albums there from 1994, turning 30 this year. And I think that these albums as a whole should rank higher in people's minds today with the uh, maybe the sole one that doesn't being the Pink Floyd Division Bell, as I know that one's probably slipped down the rankings a bit. But I think all five of these should be considered classics today, 30 years on. And I'm curious to know your thoughts on these five albums. All right, everyone. Take care. Have a good one. And I'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.